What is up? Today is the day. The day has finally come where we're going to talk about my DSLR camera trap. It's been a long time coming. I finally got it uh, back from the field and we're going to discuss it. So the first reason uh, that you might want a camera trap is because you're going to get up close and personal uh, with wildlife in a way that you haven't been able to before. You get kind of this voyeuristic look at nature. You see the animals in their habitats. Uh, just how they would be going through nature if no humans were around. So the idea is you deploy this, you scout a location, you deploy it, and you kind of get them in their natural habitats. The second reason why you may want to do something like this is you can get really cool composites of you or your kids or whatever with wildlife. And I've done this before. You take a test shot when you're setting everything up and then the animals come in after a week or two or whatever, and then you can composite them in Photoshop. And it creates this kind of surreal uh, image, but we're not gonna discuss all that today. We're gonna talk about the gear. We're gonna talk about the settings. Uh, what else? We're going to talk about scouting and patience and having a little bit of luck, to be honest. Okay, so first things first, we're going to talk about the gear. This right here is just the base of it. I started off with PVC. It was too weak. It deployed twice and it just it wasn't strong enough. So I went with wood. I have two by fours and I don't know, a little bit bigger piece of wood. Just screwed them down. And then this is a, a big ass <laughs> uh, ram mount. The reason why I went with ram mounts, um, they're a little bit more expensive uh, for the build. But it allows you to position this however you want. Uh, basically, any degree of angle up high, you can get it down low, etc. So we're going to get into the gear here and uh, hopefully talk through everything. So first things first, this. This is the bag that houses everything in it. Uh, you might be saying, well, where'd you get this? This is just a recycled bag. This is my old high school basketball bag that was collecting dust in the closet. Uh, but I need something to basically carry this gear out when I'm deploying it in nature. Uh, so here's the base. So I carry this and then I just sling this over my shoulder. This houses everything uh, that we need. So let's break it down. We are gonna start with the camera uh, because that's probably the most important. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this down and pull everything out one by one. So this is the camera. As you can see, this is the little uh, ball mount that you would mount here. So let me just rig this up real quick and I'll show you how this works. Maybe. There we go. So as you can see, I can position this however I want. I can go low, I can go high. If this isn't on a flat surface, if it's maybe on an incline, it'll allow me to adjust and adjust it properly. Uh, so this is the camera. Uh, the camera is housed in this Pelican 1300 case uh, that I've modified, obviously. Uh, it was originally orange, didn't like that. Wildlife will notice that, so I painted it matte black. Uh, the next thing you'll see is I cut out a hole and then I mounted, not mounted, but then I inserted a PVC plumbing attachment that was a specific size. I had to do all these measurements because what I did is I epoxied this in so that it was uh, weather tight because we don't want any moisture getting in there. And then what I did down here is I got a step-up ring or step-up filter and then mounted or screwed in uh, a UV filter to add protection uh, to the element here because we don't want bugs or moisture or anything getting in there. And the reason why I went with the screw in filter with the step up ring is if this gets damaged or broke, I can screw it out and replace it. I've seen other builds where people maybe uh, epoxy something in or have something that's actually in there. But then the way I see that is you'd have to replace the whole thing if anything got damaged. Not that it would get damaged, but just because. The other reason why uh, you want something like this, <coughs> this hood, is it's gonna protect from moisture and stuff building up on the lens and it just adds a little bit more protection. So that's the reason why I did those. Uh, and then on the bottom here is that ram mount that we discussed. Let's crack this bad boy open because inside is the camera. Uh, one thing, I'll try to point this out and maybe I'll get some B-roll of it. Here's everything as it sits. Uh, these cases usually come with foam. If you buy an aftermarket one um, or a Facebook marketplace or eBay, if it doesn't have foam, you can easily buy the foam. I'm not exactly sure, but if you do your research, you can find it. It's a pick and peel foam, so you can basically um, pick and peel the uh, form that you need to fit your camera and your triggers and stuff, which is actually nice because that foam adds another layer of like noise insulation as well. Because as I will point out here, we'll pull this camera out. Uh, what I've used is a DSLR. And one thing with DSLRs, unlike mirrorless, is they're not very quiet. You're gonna hear the slap of the mirror. So here, I'll pull this out and then I'll just show you the inside with the camera out. Uh, I've cut out a space for the triggers and the battery pack, and then it just sits in there. Uh, and the cool thing, like I said, the foam dampens all the noise. So once this is completely shut, you can't even hear, um, you know, the, the um, shutter closing and opening. So we'll close this up quick. Now, what camera should you use? Here's what I would say. Get the cheapest camera that you can get that fits your budget. 
I got very lucky. I picked up this camera. I put it out on my Instagram stories and actually another photographer in the Milwaukee area, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, had this T3i, I believe, just laying around collecting dust. I paid $50 for the camera and the lens. So brings me to the second point. What kind of lens should be using? Just a kit lens. This is an 1855. Uh, I would just go with that because honestly what we were shooting here we're going to be using uh flashes and external lights so the other thing when we get to the settings port you're going to be using a higher aperture to make sure more things are in focus anyway so the lens really doesn't matter a kit lens will do you just fine the cheapest camera uh that you can pick up essentially uh but on that note when you go to get your triggers and stuff you'll want to make sure that everything speaks to one another uh, but the trigger system that i'm using speaks with lots of different cameras you just need different cords um, so $50 for the camera and lens, this is a steal of a deal, but honestly, you should be able to get an older camera, 5, 10, even 15 years old, that's maybe between $100 and $200. Uh, don't break the bank with this. Be patient. There's eBay, there's Facebook Marketplace, there's Mercury, or Mercuri. Uh, and then any of your local stores, go check those out if you have a local camera shop. See what kind of used cameras they have. And then as a final resort, the online retailer is key. Uh, B and H, any of those have used sections. So get a cheap camera. Um, yeah, that is the camera setup. Once again, we got our mount or our base, the Pelican 1300 case that's modified, um, and then the camera. Next, we should probably talk flashes. So I'm going to put this away for a second and we're going to pull out the flashes. All right, let's talk flashes. So these flashes are also housed in these waterproof, weatherproof cases. Uh, that's one thing I do want to point out. That is pretty much weatherproof, waterproof. Uh, the one time I did deploy it with the PVC, because it was weak, it tipped over in a, a torrential drown, downpour last summer. And the filter that I had in front, it's not completely waterproof, but in this instance, the camera trap had tipped backwards and it was just collecting water. So when I opened this thing up, water actually poured out. Luckily, all my gear did survive. Uh, we just had to let it dry out for a few days. Um, but just note that these ones are fully weather weatherproof. Uh, so I'll just break down these cases again. These, I believe, are Apache 1800 cases. Uh, they're very cheap. They're cheaper than the Pelican cases. I actually went to, I think, Harbor Freight to pick these up. And don't quote me. I haven't price checked them. But I want to say they were probably like 20 to 25 a piece, um, I think. And then probably shipping on top of that. But all I did with these is I cut out, you know, like with a Dremel or whatever. Actually, I might have even just used a sharp um, blade. Cut this out and then epoxied in clear um, acrylic because I had some acrylic lying around. Once again, use anything that you have lying around. There's no sense in going and spending money. But I just epoxied that in, weatherproof, completely tight seal, uh, and the flashes then have a window to basically light our subject. So I have two of these um, and I'll break one of these open. They're very, they're, they're exact same actually, the cases and uh, the flashes. They just sit in here. Once again, the peel and pack um, foam that's in there. And then the flashes, once again, these flashes I think cost between $20 and $30. I picked them up secondhand on eBay. These are just Nikon SB24s. Uh, you can get SB24s. I think there's SB26 and SB28s. Uh, most people go for the SB28s, but in all honesty, those have been hiking up in prices over the years, um, probably up to like $60, $70, $80. Go with the cheaper ones, the $20 to $30 ones. The reason why people go for these Nikons is because they have uh, a, a few things. They keep their charge longer, meaning they don't discharge the batteries, and they have an excellent wake-up uh, period. So what you typically do, and you're not going to be able to see this. I'll probably show B-roll. But on these flashes, there's an off, there's a standby, and on. You put these in standby, and they can last as long as the batteries are going to last. I've deployed these in the summertime up to over a month, and the flashes still have a charge. It's honestly the triggers that die uh, before the flashes. So... Go with those SB24s. They're cheaper, uh, and once again, they're going to last long uh, with those AA batteries, and then they wake very quickly. So when your trigger or your sensor triggers the camera and everything, the flashes wake up instantly, and that's why people uh, seek out those SB24s and 28s, etc. Uh, but there's nothing fancy there. So with the cases and the flashes, you're looking at probably about 40 to 50 bucks a piece here. Uh, so when so far with just the camera and the flashes, were, my build is about at... Uh, $150 just, just with that gear alone because everything else was scrap. All right, the next part that we should discuss is the actual sensor itself. So I am not sponsored by any of this. I've just uh, read it together, together as I see fit. I'll actually link to the video that uh, prompted me to all this. Neil uh, Jernigan, I think is his name. Awesome K2 
camera trapper, I think from down south. Uh, he has a very similar setup because I basically kind of copied him and just made a few improvements here and there. Uh, but we're both running uh, Cam Traptions. So Cam Traptions, once again, not sponsored. They have amazing triggering and um, receivers, etc. Once again, they're going to fit multiple camera types. They have different models. They have version one of the sensor all the way up to this is version three. Uh, it is a PIR sensor. Now, what is PIR? PIR is an acronym for Passive Infrared. All that means is not only is it sensing motion, but it's sensing a heat signature as well. Uh, so the one thing I will say about these triggers or this sensor uh, in particular, uh, it's got these barn doors so you can kind of uh, funnel the, the sense that it, or the, the focus of where it's sensing. Um, there's a lot that this thing can do. The manual is a good read and you need to read it and you need to test some things at home. There's all these settings that you can mess with. Um, there's a whole, whole slew of levers and dials and uh, switches here that you set you can set it to shoot video you can set it to, set it to shoot uh, photos you can trigger it to do a burst of photos you can set a delay there's other sensors or uh, limiters on here for time and frequency and how much motion it would sense so you really need to play with this uh, one word of advice test test again and read that manual because a few times on my first deployments i wasn't too familiar with the sensor and i had the limits on the luminosity meaning basically it's only going to sense uh, at a particular uh, light level and I had it set to dark so when I was trying to test it in the daylight it wasn't triggering and I thought my whole system was failing so all I had to do was adjust that little sensor to make sure that it would trigger in just a little bit of ambient light uh, and then then we we're ready to go so this is gonna be probably the most expensive part of your build is the sensor and triggers and I will pull out one of these flashes just once again to show you the the triggers and I'm not this isn't gonna be in depth this is just kind of high level of what we're doing here so all this trigger does, or this sensor, is it senses the motion, and then it's gonna send a signal both to the camera and the flashes to wake up the flashes, wake up the camera, and trigger the flashes and the camera. So it all speaks together nicely. Uh, you'll have to, once again, read the manual. I'm not gonna go over it here, but you know the receiver and the triggers, they have certain channels that they can speak to. Uh, same with the sensor in the, the camera. Um, so it's worth uh, looking into that. If you guys wanna learn more about that, I can maybe make a more in-depth video on that. The only other thing that I did with this build is I, I opted for um, these battery packs to extend the battery life because originally these triggers and receivers run off of triple A's. Well, they're not going to last too long in the wild, uh, so I went with double A's. And this whole setup in the wintertime can definitely last me at least a month running off of double A rechargeable batteries. Uh, those Fox photos, that series that you saw, uh, was in the dead of winter here in Wisconsin and temperature very, uh, temperatures are very cold. So I was getting about a week. Uh, just because the batteries don't like don't like the cold weather, so that is the camera, the flashes, the sensor, and the triggers. What else am I forgetting here? So we've talked about all that. There's a few more odds and ends that are actually in this bag that I do want to go over and talk about real quick. Uh, and for this, I'm just going to pull the bag up here because uh, you might be thinking, what is the sensor then mounted to? I have this this real tree. It's called an easy hanger. I think usually uh, bow hunters or deer hunters use this type of thing. This thing is cool because it articulates out. It's got a little ball head here that's actually kind of, I, I think you can probably swap this out. This one's getting kind of weathered. But what you do is you would screw this into a tree. And then what I do is the sensor has uh, a quarter 20 on the bottom as well. And you can uh, basically screw this into a tree or wood or whatever. I've put it in a barn before. And then this ball head, you can position this wherever you want. You can position it upside down. Uh, it's really cool actually and very versatile once again thanks to neil go check out his video because uh, he's the one that i'm basically copying his build here and making those improvements the other thing that i have in this bag is a drill uh, what i'm doing and i got a bag of little screws here what i do with the ram mounts in particular i haven't really talked about those yet is those i'll pull up this flash here here's an example these are smaller ones for the flashes but you can screw these into trees uh, or wood if you're in a barn or whatever and you can see how i can position this if this is mounted in a tree or whatever i can position this however i see fit you know it's going to move around on this ram mount and i can get really cool dynamic lighting uh, i'll show behind the scenes of the fox setup i had taken video uh, of that i'll try to interject that here uh, it's real simple just a front flash back flash to get some uh, backlighting uh, etc uh, and that's pretty much it a few more odds and ends just like a little paint scraper uh, that helps with trying some stuff out and then the screws and that's pretty much it for the gear uh, let's talk settings real quick so let's talk settings once again because we're using a flash setup 
Uh, if you're not familiar with flash, don't be scared about it. Uh, it's intimidating at first, but basically the flash is going to light the scene. Um, so what does that mean? What it means for me is my camera setup, it doesn't vary too much, but I usually set my shutter speed uh, to about 1 over 1 60th of a second. Once again, because of the flashes that we're using, it's going to freeze the motion anyways. And the animals aren't running through here, so you're not going to get blur. Don't worry about blur. And once again, the flashes are going to freeze it anyways. So 1 over 160, give or take. I think the flashes sync is up to 1 to 50th of a second. Um, so usually keep it below that. And once again, usually the slower the shutter speed, the better anyways, because you'll get more ambient light then. Let's say a deer or a fox or a raccoon or whatever you're trying to trap walks through at sunset or dusk. That way you'll get more color in the sky uh, because it's a, a lower shutter speed. Um, second, the aperture. My aperture is usually set between f8 and f11. The reason why I do this is because uh, I want as much in focus as possible. I'm not going for an artistic photo here. I don't need uh, shallow depth of field. I need deep depth of field. So the way you get that is once again you have a larger aperture number because more things are going to be in focus. And on that note, no, uh, no uh, autofocus. Manual focus only here. I'm going to open this back up. You might have noticed when I took this camera out, there's tape on the front of this on the lens, on the kit lens. You might think I was putting it back together or something, but the reason what I do, the reason why that is, what I do is uh, when I get to my scene, I set everything up the way I want it, like that fox photo, I knew it'd be coming between those rocks because I had tracked them. So I set my scene up, set my composition, set my manual focus of where I think they're gonna be when the photo's gonna take, and then just lock it down, tape it up, tape the button so nothing gets jostled when I put this back in here. And that, coupled with the high aperture number of f8, f11, most likely everything should be in focus. At least that's, the, that's our goal, right? And then finally, you might be wondering, what is my ISO set at? I set my ISO uh, to auto. In this particular camera, I believe, once again, I think this is a T3i. This camera has an auto ISO, and with the auto ISO, you can set kind of a ceiling or a threshold. And I don't think I have it going over 3200. Uh, check your camera, because that is a great setting to adjust and control. Because what that basically does is say, hey, if I have this set to auto ISO, don't go past 3200. Um, because if you don't have that set, it's just going to blow your ISO out the ceiling and you'll come home with photos that are at like 12,500 or whatever, 12,800. Uh, and you're going to have very noisy and grainy photos. Now, if that does happen to you, once again, this is not sponsored, but I have stumbled upon and started using in my workflow of even sports photography or anything that has higher ISO noise uh, with this program called, uh, what is it, uh, DxO Pure Raw. If you want a video on that, uh, let me know in the comments below because that program has changed my whole workflow, especially for sports photography. It fits in nicely. Uh, it's the last thing I do, and it just gets rid of all the noise. Uh, I don't know how it does it. It does witchcraft with camera profiles and lens profiles, and it's just, just awesome. So if that does happen to you, look at that. Once again, not sponsored. Uh, you can check them out on your own. What else do I need to talk about here? We talked about the gear. We talked about the settings. Let's talk about uh, scouting and patience and luck. Um, so the first thing that you're going to want to do when you're trying to trap an animal with your camera trap is you need to make sure cameras are there. Uh, one thing that most of these camera trappers have is a trail cam. I don't. I re actually rely on the community, family, and friends to let me know where animals are at. So the few times that I had deployed this, I know for 100% guarantee animals are in the area. So let's look at the fox series just for a quick second. I got tipped off that there were foxes in the area. And in the past summer, I knew the foxes were there. I just didn't know what they do in the wintertime or how their activity is in the wintertime. So anyways, I was tipped off. And I tracked them and scouted them with my long lens for two to three days before I'm like, hey, I should just probably deploy the camera trap just to see what I can get. So that was the scouting part. The patience part typically comes in at this point where you would deploy it and wait, but I got very lucky. So what I did is I scouted where they were kind of in this wooded area, and I found these awesome rocks that I thought would make a great composition. Uh, from there, I set up my uh, camera trap and kind of set it where I thought they would be coming through. I saw there was a path that they had cut through for the last three days in the snow, which also helps, where they were coming between these rocks. And I'm like, what a great composition. Fox between the rocks, awesome. So what I did, set up the camera trap, set up my sensor, set up my flashes so I had a key light in front, and I had that hair light, the backlight coming in from behind, and I knew that's where the scene would uh, take place. I'm going to show you the whole series now because this is where luck really comes into play. I got so lucky with this series. The reason why I say that is because after I deployed that camera trap for the foxes, that what I consider an award-winning series happened an hour after I set that up. I can look at the timestamps. They came at, I think it was like five o'clock in the afternoon, right at dusk, and it was, it was mind boggling. But if you look at the series, you'll notice if we go through progression, progression, the fox came in, camera right, 
and was actually going back through the scene. What happened is, or this is what I think is my theory, the camera trap triggered, and because I have it set to a burst of I think three or five photos every time it trips, it triggered, the flashes went off, and that got the fox's attention. The fox then turned around, came back, and got curious, and that's when I got, I couldn't have posed this fox any better if I even tried to. My goal was to have a picture of a fox coming between those rocks. What I got was this fox being curious with one paw up, head tilt, looking directly <laughs> at my camera trap setup. Uh, so that is the lucky part. The patience part, once again, didn't come in in this particular setup, but in past setups, usually what happens is you scout the animals with a camera, uh, DSLR, or, or uh, just a regular camera trap or trail cam, or you track them with tracks and you know they're in the area. You deploy your camera trap and you might have to wait for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, etc. because A, either they're not in the area because they're moving around, particularly deer, or B, they need to get used to the setup because they might avoid it. And that's another thing that I don't do with this particular one. Some people will actually try to uh, camouflage it uh, with camouflage, like um, not tarp, but like netting and stuff. Uh, so they have to get used to it or uh, just literally just play the patience game because you don't know how they're moving, when they're moving, if they're uh, scared off by this. If it's something foreign in their, their neighborhood, they're not going to probably go up to it. Uh, if they're curious like the fox, you might get lucky. Uh, but that's the patience part. You need to scout, be patient, and be lucky. But in my opinion, luck is when preparation uh, kind of meets uh, opportunity. So that's what happened with my Fox series. That is my DSLR camera uh, trap setup. I'll try to then post here, kind of list out how, uh, how much everything costs. Uh, once again, the sensor is going to be the most expensive part. So between this gear here, I think was about $150. The sensor and the triggers, I'll have to look up. That was probably another $250 roughly. But I'd say definitely under an $800 budget, you can have this very same setup. And then it just really comes out to scouting, uh, patience, persistence, and luck. Uh, but it's really cool. It's, it's kind of a cool uh, opportunity uh, for photographers, especially with that, that passive infrared uh, setup. You can get one of these cheap older cameras. You can set this out for a month, and it's going to be taking photos for you, uh, which is kind of cool. It's going to be taking photos while you're sleeping, while you're at work, while you're doing other gigs. And then you go and retrieve it, and it's kind of like Christmas morning. You don't know what you're going to get. I'll never forget. Those Fox series, I looked at the back of the camera and I literally texted my wife and I said, I got, I've got, i got award-winning photos here uh, and it's pretty cool. So that's all I have. If you have any questions, let me down, down below. Uh, I'll try to answer them. I try to read through all of them and answer them. If you have anything more that you want me to elaborate on, let me know. This is just kind of a high level. I'm trying to keep this video short. Uh, but if you want to know more about settings, particular gear setup, maybe the triggers, uh, that denoising software I use, just let me know and I'll try to make a video I work a nine to five. I got three kids. I'm busy. I got sick. So uh, you'll just have to be patient with me. But uh, thanks for sticking around. And until next time, keep shooting, have fun, and get out there. Get out there and do something, all right? Peace. All right. Didn't I talk about... Oh, I forgot to talk about batteries. Forgot to talk about batteries. Let me talk about those batteries. Double A's. So everything runs off of double A's. Uh, there's, four per... there's four per flash, plus two for the uh, triggers. So that's six per flash. The sensor runs off of six, so we got six, 12, 18. Uh, the camera I actually bought off of, I think, Key and Key, K E H, whatever you want to call it, uh, a battery uh, grip so I can get two batteries in there. That camera, I mean, the camera always has, that's the least of the worries. It's usually the, the sensor or the triggers or the flashes that the batteries go last, but you, everything runs off about 20 batteries. Then I bought this big ass charger off of Amazon that I'll link below. Uh, what I do is I have these just AA rechargeables that I also bought off of Amazon. I got any loops, and I can't remember the other brand. Uh, but what I do is I just cycle them. So this past winter with the Foxes, I did leave it out for at least a month, and I had to go back weekly to change batteries. So I have, I think, about 20 in, and then I have 20 that I have charged up at all times so I can easily swap them back and forth. This thing is awesome. So it actually only uh, fits 16, but you can just charge this overnight, and you're ready to go again. And then you just wait until you need to redeploy or swap batteries and boom goes the dynamite all right what else gotta look at my notes here make sure i didn't forget anything else battery settings da, 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 da. that's it that's it i'm done that's all i got let me know if you have any questions and i'll see you guys next time